Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We put together a guide with some recommendations to help you focus on being financially fit at different milestones in your life. Some of you may be ahead of schedule, while others may have to play catch up. You can download this guide for free on our website. The link to download Your Path to a Lifetime of Financial Success is listed in the episode description. Or you can go to wiserinvestor.com, scroll to the bottom, and find it there. Now on to today's episode. Welcome to a Wiser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. Uh, Brad, uh, we're getting back into our theme for this quarter, um, how to be financially successful in your fill in the blanks. We've gone from 20s to now we're in our 50s. Happened really fast. We're aging quickly here. <laughs> it does happen faster than we think. <laughs> Um, so let's focus on 50 year olds today. And honestly, uh, this one's pretty easy because our average client here at our firm is around 55 to 58 comes down every year because of our hourly planning program that, that brings in people that are, that are, um, you know, even 40 and under at times. So it's, it's, we're getting to be a younger group, but, um, we are, um, certainly working, working with pre-retirees mostly, and those that are um, have just entered into retirement. Um, so I guess, you know, we're in this weird time. Uh, S&P 500 is, is down. Uh, what's our what's our number now? On the S&P? Yeah. It's around 37, I think. It may be heading, you so know. We're still down about 15, 18% this year. Oh, yes. Yes. From, know, from the beginning of the year. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We, we We've got, had yeah. a little little run up recently. In October was a very good month. Um, so, so let's talk about hoping it continues in November. Let's talk about people getting spooked. This you is know? huge. This is huge. It, it, as as we roll into our fifties, and we hear this a lot from clients and see it firsthand, it's becoming very real to them that they're going to retire. They have shorter number of years before retirement than they did when they started their careers. So when we do have market events, jolts in the market or slow sell-offs like we've seen this year, it really affects our clients differently in their 50s than say in their 30s or even in their 40s. And they tend to get spooked very easily. Well, the, the knee-jerk reaction is um, I'm losing money and I'm tired of losing all this money and we're just going to go to cash. Um, and, and if we go to cash, you you forget that uh, you're no longer getting dividends, so you've given up probably close to a 2% yield. Right, which we're reinvesting right now. Right. We're buying more shares, and we're buying them low. Right. Lower valuation than before. You get more shares um, per dollar than what you did prior to the stock market falling. And then usually you say, okay, I understand your feelings. Uh, tell me, uh, when do you think you get back into the market? And the answer is always like, well, we just feel better about the future. Like, well, when are you going to feel better about the future? Right. And well, I really don't know. Yeah. He's like, you're going to feel better about the future when the market's, the Dow's back to 37,000. That's when you're going to feel great. And then you're going to put your money back to work. And now you've lost maybe 15 to 20% of your money. And then you missed out because, you know, the, the percentage down is not the percentage back up, right? Right. <laughs> you don't right. lose 50 and gain 50 to get back to 100. You have to gain 100 to you get You have to back. gain 100. If you lose 50, you have to gain right. 100% of your money back in order to get back to That's right. where you so started. That means you're losing that on a 50% rate of return potentially. Yeah, exactly. Because, because and it's the beginning be the of, a, of a market movement where you earn the most, quite frankly. Right. Yeah, so, if you miss out on the beginning and you only get the latter portions of it, yeah. of any market movement in upwards direction, you're not getting anywhere near the total return that you get by being invested when it was lower, Right. and you're getting those gains at that point in time. So you stay the course. That's what you got to do. Uh, don't get, you know, don't get spooked. So I, I know some of our clients will say, I haven't looked. I just haven't looked. And I've heard some very prominent, um, more nationally syndicated uh, you know, financial people saying, just don't look at it. <laughs> just stay away from it. It's like, it's like, well, geez. we look at it. But okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. is right. Um, and then, so, yeah. W- so when you do look at it, <laughs> you want to make sure that you're maintaining a proper investment allocation. That's very important. It's just as important. Should the market go on a downward trajectory and an upwards trajectory. So in a downward trajectory, you still want to re- maintain your target allocation. So if it requires 
it, your portfolio to be rebalanced in a down market, then you rebalance it in the same manner that you would and in an up market. Because in a down market, you're buying things at a lower valuation. And we've used this analogy before, and I like it, and that is where you're, it's like a, a spring that's being compressed. Mm-hmm. As the prices are going down and you're adding to it, you're compressing the spring, you're buying more and more shares so that when the market goes back up, the spring releases and you get a greater bounce. Yeah, it's just hard to be patient to wait for that, and that, ultimately, that's what you have to. That's what you have to be. Um, I'll add on asset allocation too, is that people think as they approach retirement that they have to get more conservative, and that's not the case at all. Your money is going to go to work for you when you retire. It's been kind of building over time. Now, if you're in all growth stocks, maybe yeah, it's time to diversify. But ultimately, you don't think anything worse than a sixty forty portfolio in this market. 60 stock, 40 bonds. That's got to be the most conservative allocation you have, I think. I think so as well. Um, And the reason is because, as you and I were talking just prior to this, is that the portfolio's primary purpose is to pay out income in a retirement period. And that retirement period, within our planning scope at least, is almost 40 years. Almost, yeah. Yeah. So it's a very long time. And there's going to be other market events in that 40-year period. It's, it's, um, you said pay out income. It used to be you could retire and live off of your income. So you'd have dividends and uh, from your stocks and you have interest you know, from your bonds. In the last two decades, it's been really hard to do that because of this low interest environment. If, if the Fed doesn't overreach and you just cause a complete mess of things for the next two years, um, you're in a position now where bonds actually could start paying reasonable income. Maybe maybe we're going to climb back to where you could actually live off your income and, and leave the shares alone. Or at least to a point where the bonds are now contributing to the total return through the their portfolio. dividend payments you know, yeah. in a much more significant manner. And if that's the case, Casey, it may be that we actually pare back on our equity exposure a little bit because the bonds are making up for it and the portfolios can actually become, if not more conservative, Rather, we can de-risk them slightly, still get that same expected return that clients need in retirement at a lower risk level. Ultimately, right now, though, um, you have to carry more volatility in the portfolio to achieve objectives. Right. Um, Being super conservative and and holding 20, 30 percent bonds or stock in a portfolio is just not going to be enough. So you have to take on that volatility. That's something that we decided to do here many years ago. Is it, okay, we're going to take on a little more volatility in client portfolios. We'll hold their hand. We'll try to over-communicate with them through emails and newsletters, um, knowing that that was the right thing to do for them in the long term, uh, even though they get really frustrated with with times like right now. But when you look back at the t- last 10 years, it's been really good, even despite the the pullback that we have now. We ha- we haven't, we're not even close to touching the 2020 COVID low. No, we're not. That, no, we're not. That's crazy to think about uh, that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> what has happened is investors have determined that there was a high watermark, and their minds have attached to that yes. valuation. Yes. And then from that point to where we are, they consider that a loss of value. But if they were to go back a little bit further and figure out what the low watermark was, they'll see that their portfolios are still in an upward valuation. I've had yeah. one conversation like that, I think, Maybe more people think it, but only one conversation. It was recently in 22 years of doing this where someone was judging their performance, not based on where they started, but what the highest value was. And somehow we were supposed to have determined that that was the highest value that day. And somehow we were supposed to sell everything (laughs) that day because we would have should have known that that was the highest value the portfolio would ever get to. It was the most strange conversation. You know, I get it. I get it from someone who uh, just doesn't understand how this works. But for someone who is educated as this person, it was, it was, it was just, I was like, am I having this conversation with this person? Like this person's like super smart. I put him up on a pedestal and, and, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, they don't understand. They think that the stock market's a big gambling machine. And we should have known that that all the jacks have passed and the aces and the, I don't know how to play cards, but yeah. all the kings. <laughs> we should have known that all these yeah. kings have been dealt, right? And 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 that there's no way in our, you know, that that it's only crap cards out there. Yeah. We should have just folded or yeah. maybe it's opposite. I don't know. You get my analogy. Yeah. You know, and that's, 
I, I won't even you know give, say that that's difficult. That's just impossible. That it we don't impossible. know the future, right? That. And for us to make a call like that, yeah, is only means that we're going to miss out on future highs when they do come because right. we won't have known when the low was to yeah. reinvest the money. So we'll have missed out on that. So it's it's investing it by its nature, and you hear this over and over and over because it's true. It is such a long term proposition that when we make our portfolios, we construct them with different asset classes that we call healthy asset classes. We're already taking into consideration these events occur from time to time. Right. We already know it. We just don't know when, and we don't know what causes them. But in a free market economy, these things do happen. And it shakes out you know, dollars that are um, from, a, from a marketplace that are not being used well. Okay, They're not at their highest use. So what happens is as investors pull money out of low-use um, assets, they reinvest them in high-use assets and get that higher return. But unfortunately, to the low-use asset, that drives down prices even further. Right. But that's how a market economy operates. You know, something else that you got to think about in your 50s is you're probably getting close to being done with paying for college. Um, I think in most scenarios by your late 50s, right? Right. Kids are... Kids are now young adults on their own, and um, you got to get them off the payroll because for most Americans, you haven't saved enough. You got a ways to go. Yes. So, yeah, you, this is a time know. for for people to use every disposable dollar for savings, for savings and accumulation and yep. for future investment. All those dollars that you had been spending, we had been spending raising our children and our families are now diverted towards the goal of our retirements. And it's not being selfish, Casey. It's not being, you know, shutting other people off. It's saying now it's time for us to save as much as we can so that we can maintain this lifestyle and thusly this relationship within our family of independence and financial security so that the next generation can live independently with financial security as well. So the next generation could live without their parents in the basement, right? <laughs> that could be something right. that changes, right? That's right. Well, the government knows that you need to save extra money because when you turn 50, you can put an additional $6,500 into your 401k account. It's called a catch-up provision. That's right. That's right. So, That's right. So they recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, people in Congress at some point realized, hey, we need to save more. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's easy to do. It's the, how do you implement that though? Is it can be different on different platforms. Um, I've noticed a lot of fidelity accounts. Uh, you know, if you just do the you say max, uh, it doesn't include the catch up. The catch up is a whole different uh, box below. So you have to intentionally select the catch up. Where other ones, you just put in how much you want to you know contribute a percentage, and it'll just keep it'll keep doing it all, all the way through up to the up to the max in the 401k. So you do have to be careful to make sure that your settings are correct in your 401k if you're trying to do the catch up. Um, Cause I just noticed Vanguard, Vanguard makes it easier. Fidelity makes it a little more difficult. Um, and those are the two biggest uh, 401k providers out there. Right. So you want to look at your, well your income relative to the percentage that you're having withheld for yeah. contributions to change right. that in such a way that by December 31st, you'll have maxed out, which includes the extra compens uh, additions through your catch-up contributions. So, right. Yeah. So and you put in 20... Next year, these numbers are going to get bigger. Right. Um, but yeah, Because it's 22,500 plus the 6,500. Yeah, yeah, plus the 6,500. So you're at $29,000. You can contribute in catch-up contributions. Right. So if you're making um, $200,000 um, uh, $200, a year, that's that's basically 14.5%. So call it 15% that you'd be putting away into your 401k uh, to hit that max number. What I'm saying is if you put in 15% and don't, don't select the catch up, it'll stop at 22,500. Yeah. And then you're still not putting in the max. So that's something we've noticed a lot on, on 401k uh, contributions. Um, I, you know, you mentioned it earlier in our pre-show chat, but um, nothing is, you, this is not the time to be accumulating debt. If you've always had a new car, if you've always done, um, the best of the best. This might be the time if you haven't saved enough that it's time to drive that car longer. It's try. It's time to do some different things uh, to make sure that you're accumulating emergency reserves 
uh, for yourself that you have enough, uh, if something derails that you can um, uh, recover. Uh, it could be medical. You think about that when you get a little older. If you're out for medical, can you can you get by? Do you have, do you have enough PTO time? Do you have enough? Uh, do you have short term disability in place? Long term disability, uh, but most importantly, savings um, that's built up after savings. Then um, you know, are you putting enough away for retirement? It's just re- retirement planning comes in. That's we get busy with a lot of fifty year olds trying to calculate that. Exactly. And exactly. Start looking at other things. You're also probably have a higher net worth now. So it's now it's time to p- try to protect things. So think about property casualty. There's a lot of people right now that our homes have gone up so much in value. Do we have enough coverage to protect our homes? That's an excellent point because I think that what happens as we, you know, go through our fifties, we're thinking in terms of scaling back some of these structural payments that we've been making, mm-hmm. thinking that, oh, you know, I don't need this anymore. But the reality is that the, our financial condition has changed so much in the real estate market, and we need to keep up with that. And generally speaking, it's, you know, you know buying more insurance or buying now, um, um, what's the insurance for um, identity theft, things of those natures, where a one occurrence can be, although rare, it can be large. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, another one is umbrella. A lot of people aren't, aren't that's right. uh, enough umbrella insurance. That's something that we're doing in our review meetings now to make sure that all of our clients have the appropriate uh, umbrella set. But if, right. you're, if your net worth over a million dollars, you'd have a million dollar umbrella. If it's two million, then a two million, three, four, five, and so on. About five, um, there's some other strategies. But certainly um, two to three million dollar umbrella policies for most of our clients is, is very, very important. Easy in this litigious society that we're in. You know, a small car accident could end up, you know, yep. being a, a lawsuit of some sort that, you know, you weren't obviously expecting and may not be covered by your a single, you know, simple car insurance policy. I think they max there is like 300,000. 300 or 500. Most people don't have 500. Um, today, you know, it's all like how cheap or am I getting the best rate? And right. everything's so price conscious. And I tell our clients that we're not trying to find the best price. We want a fair price, but ultimately we're trying to find quality of coverage. Exactly. And, and now is not the time to become penny wise and pound (laughs) foolish. foolish, Is it? I mean, now that you have assets, now that we have assets, it's time to protect them and we protect them differently at different stations in life. Okay. When we're younger, we protect our assets, which our primary is our ability to earn income. So life insurance is a huge portion. As we get older, maybe that life insurance is a little less, but the umbrella, the liability, the yep. property casualty becomes a little more. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Um, the other thing is, you know, we had a whole series on this last uh, quarter, but just start thinking about legacy. Think about your estate planning that you've put in place, but more importantly, um, are the people that you're surrounding yourself with in your family, um, are do they really understand what your personal mission is, right? Do they have a personal mission? Are we teaching the next, have we taught the next generation to think like first generation entrepreneurs, right? Um, Donald Miller has a great book, Hero and a Mission. I believe that you did uh, the workshop on that um, probably last year sometime. Uh, on, it had a little pr- personal productivity, I think was built into it, but um, a Hero and a Mission, we did a, podcast recently with Marty Paradise and, and Paradise Consult Business Consulting. And it's interesting that he has all his new clients start with hero and a mission. Like what is your purpose? And therefore the dr- the business you have should be driving what your, your self purpose is. Right. And, and not everybody is a business owner, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a structure, an organization referred to as a family, right? You know, that, that those principles couldn't be applied towards what is your mission as a family? To be a family that's you know self sufficient, to be you know a, a blessing in their community and to one another, et cetera. So there's still a lot of things that could be and are applicable, even though you may not be a business owner. Right, mm-hmm. and that does you don't get that through estate planning. Estate planning is just preparing documents. Uh, ultimately, you have to think about what what your personal legacy is. But check that book out, Hero and a Mission. That might give you some guidance. Uh, on, on, on building that. I have not done that yet. Uh, it is on my to-do list um, after I read about some of the other things I've been meaning to read about. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, Brad, thank you. Uh, anything else to add? No, this is a good conversation. This is very pertinent. You know, this is where, you know, there's an inflection in life that occurs in our 50s as our children and our families are growing. Now the time for us in our 50s and uh, me for my 60s to begin that self-reflection, okay? We move from one station of life into another. How do we want to live out the next station in life? And this is the time to prepare. The decisions made in our 50s affect our 60s, 70s, and 80s right. tremendously. All right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Casey. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We would also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. We would love to hear from you. This episode was produced and edited by Wilton Moore. This podcast is strictly for informational purposes only and is not to be considered as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any financial products, securities, digital assets, or any other investment vehicles or a basis to make any financial decisions. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. The host and or guest may personally own securities, digital assets, or other investment vehicles mentioned on this podcast. Neither the host nor guest of the show are compensated for their participation and no referral fees are paid to or received by any host or guest for clients, listeners, or similar interests. Investments involve risk, and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor, tax professional, insurance professional, and or legal professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.